Welcome back. This is Larry Benko, W0QE, and today's video is about sizing cores wound on toroids. I will be comparing several cores at three different frequencies spread throughout the HF frequency range while operating the cores at flux levels significantly above the nominal maximum values in the literature. Three cores will be FT240-31 material, FT240-43 material, FT240-61 material, and the T200-2 iron powder core. They will be operated at approximately the same flux level. 12 turns of number 12 wire on the ferrite cores will give nearly the same flux level as 15 turns on the slightly smaller iron powder core. In order to test the four cores that I had wound, I took a piece of aluminum bar stock that was uh, one inch by one and a half inches, and I machined out the center of it. It's two and a quarter inches long. I drilled and tapped the end holes here and mounted two SO239s on, on the outside with a piece of 12 gauge wire in the center. I also screwed on a little uh, piece of thin copper on the bottom that would enable me to solder to it. And what the goal was to, was to be was to take a 1500 watt generator, or maybe 1600 watts, but anyways, 1500 watt plus generator into this, into this circuit on the outputs a 1500 watt dummy load and a watt meter. If I got 1500 watts out of this, I would know that the SWR here would be one to one, and I would know the voltage right here. And this would give me a known voltage to ground. At 1500 watts, that turns out to be 274 volts. And after doing that, here's what I have. You can see the thing I built in the bottom here, and, I, and here's the four cores that I'm going to test. This is the T200-2, T61, FT240-61, FT240-43, FT240-31, as indicated by the Sharpie marks on them. And this, is for, this test setup is for 160 meters, 1.85 megahertz. The inductance here was not adequate enough to give me a low SWR, so I compensated for it with a parallel uh, capacitor here. This SimSmith circuit shows the four cores in parallel that I was that the previous picture showed, and I've relabeled the names up here. You have to be a little careful. You can't use any any random characters up here. They're the turn out to be the reference designator, so they have to start with a letter, but so I used M31 for the FT240-31. I used the M43 for the FT240-43 core, this for the FT240-61 core, and this for the T200-2 core. And these impedances in, for each of these four elements are determined by the file that I loaded. And the file is, the file is different for each one of these, of course. And you can see it up in the top line here when I hover over, over it. And when I do this, I get a trace on a Smith chart that looks like this. At 1.85 megahertz, the SWR is f nearly 4.2 to 1. I c my transmitter will not put out the power into that SWR. So what I need to do is I need to compensate for this. So the simplest way to compensate for it is with a capacitor. And we can see that as I increase the uh, 2.8 nanofarads is pretty darn close right here to... SWR of 1.05 to 1 at 1.85 megahertz. This won't be this won't be suitable with the other at the higher frequencies, but it's good at 1.85 megahertz. Now we can also plot more than one frequency frequency at the same time. So let's do seven, and we're also going to do say 28.5 megahertz. I made measurements at all three of those frequencies. Put a space between there. So now I have 7 megahertz, excuse me, 1.85 megahertz, 7 megahertz, and 28. If I remove the capacitor for the other two bands, what I have is 28 megahertz has got a very good SWR, and 7 megahertz has an SWR of less than 1.5 to 1, and both those SWRs, my amplifier will put out full power. So let's look at, this, look at the square chart. And what I've done here is... I need to set this to be an X match. And by doing an X match, it means I'm going to get the power to this point no matter what the SWR is. So it doesn't matter whether I have the capacitor in here, capacitor in here or not. I need to basically adjust my power a little bit higher than 1500 watts to get 1500 watts to the output. But what I see here 
is I see at low frequencies, I see the blue trace being a 22 watt power dissipation, and that's the 43 material, with the 31 material being right here, the green trace being the number two material. So I would suspect all three of these on 160 meters would heat up probably more than I would like based on previous tests where I determined that these, these size, the size of core that I used here is probably good for about 8 watts or something like that. I would also suspect that the 61 material core would be just fine on 160 meters. Similarly, on 40 meters, I would expect that the 41, excuse me, 43 and 31 material cores were both, would both be a little bit too hot. I would expect that the number 2 core material core and the 61 to be fine and by the time we got to uh, 10 meters or 28 megahertz I would expect the same thing would be true again and let's look at the results we get when we do that all right here's the results it's gonna be a little tricky to show both of these at the same time that may work so on 160 meters the the blue trace is the 43 material I expected it to get the hottest it did it got to 101, actually the temperature rose to 101 degrees Celsius after seven minutes. And next followed by the green trace. The green trace is the number two material and it got to 63 degrees. Very closely behind that would be the red, the red trace. The red trace was the 31 material. It got to 57 degrees. And then finally the 61 material down here was at 28 degrees Celsius. And clearly this one's plenty cool enough. You could argue these might be fine. This is 100% duty cycle, key down the whole time. So this represents a, a very bad you know, environment and probably nobody's gonna ever transmit that key down that much for, for that period of time. But uh, nevertheless, once you get that temperature, it's interesting, it took 20 minutes for the number 43 core to get down to 50 degrees Celsius. So once they get, they get warm, it takes a long time for them to cool off. If we look at 40 meters, we see again, the red and the blue trace here, which are the 31 and 43 material cores, both rose to just about the same temperature. They have both about the same expected dissipation due to, due to the calculation. And then next would be the dash two material the dash two material is the green trace it's right here and then again the 61 material was the best and it was only 23 degrees it only rose six degrees with that much to, over that period of time and then this shows it as being you know the same thing now by the time we get to 10 meters the expected dissipation of the 43 and the, and the 31 materials should be less than we saw on 40 meters so let's look and see if that's the case. We had 56 and 59 degree temperature rise. Here we had 49 and 50 degree temperature rise. So that, that appears to be pretty good. We see next followed by the 61 material, which now is more lossy than the two, number two material. And we see it having a temperature rise that's a little bit higher than the two mater, number two material, which is 25 degrees Celsius. From this, I would say, if you've got a network analyzer that can measure the impedance of the core of the coil, you know, the coil that you've wound accurately, and it's not a trivial matter to do this because we're measuring things that have reflection coefficients that are extremely high, very close to one. But if you can do that, SimSmith will predict the temperature rise extremely well. And you need to know where to put the cutoff point, but you can do a measurement once or twice, and once you know those numbers for different core types you can continue on and use that number forever. So for an FT240 core type, somewhere around eight watts seems to be a very, very good number to use. However, if you were to wind, say stack three cores on top of each other, you might not be able to get eight watts from, from each core. And the reason being is this core in the middle would not have nearly the surface area. So it may only be good for five watts or so. The ones on the end have one of their sides shielded from being able to be exposed to the air so they may be only good for seven watts but nevertheless you can you can make some measurements and and continue on the whole point of this video is to show that sim smith predicted what i measured pretty darn closely at both at all over the hf range which was kind of a 
I guess it was expected, but it was nevertheless a, a nice surprise. In this SimSmith circuit, I've added one more inductor type. I did not actually test it in parallel with the other ones. I tested it separately. The circuit's a little different. It shows a 274 volt absolute voltage generator, but it's the same voltage as the other cores had before. And what this one is comprised of is 25 turns of number 12 wire wand around 90% of the core, but it's three FT240-61 cores stacked on top of each other. So I expected it to, to be able to tolerate higher voltage. And what we see on the orange trace here is we see it's got extremely low dissipation up through 30 megahertz, and then it goes, goes awry and we, we get resonances and stuff. And I, I started at winding turns on here and I kept winding them and kept winding them until I got to the point where I started getting this, this first resonant point to be close enough to 10 meters that I decided I wanted to stop. So 25 turns was the number. But if we look at this, we see that, that, this, that this orange trace is below all the other ones throughout the entire HF range. And let's, if we assume now again, like I said before, that it's three cores, so the end cores are good for seven watts a piece and say five watts for the middle core, that's 19 watts total. Can I get to a thousand volts across this core before I get 19 watts? Let's see where we're going here. Looks like we can. So at 1,000 1, volts, we have just a tad less than 10 watts. Here we have one watt, and here we have virtually nothing um, with this three stacked cores. So this would be a solution if you wanted to try to build a ballon that had, had to be able to um, I uh, withstand a thousand volts across it. Now the problem with doing that is 25 turns. 25 turns, and if you do in a bell and you need two conductor transmission line you're winding, it probably won't have this performance. But nevertheless, this is all part of the game you have to play when you try to wind stuff and try to get the, you know, you're playing the game between impedance and where the first resonant point is and that kind of stuff. But um, this is certainly not a, not a bad place to start. Um, people have suggested that maybe 31 and 40, 43 materials would work also as well if you put enough turns on. I didn't do that test, but um, it's certainly something that could be done. But nevertheless, this, um, you know, again, this has been an interesting set of experiments to do, and it was, it's been a lot of fun. And here's another Sim Smith circuit. You may have noticed when I showed the original FT240-43 material measurements at 1.85 megahertz, that the temperature rose quite a bit. But notice what's happening here. All these others, the temperature is, each minute, the rise in temperature is not as much as the previous minute, except for this one. This one, it was, it was large to begin with, and then it stabilized, and then it started, but it doesn't get any, any smaller. What, we, what we're seeing here is the effects of some thermal runaway. The core material is actually, the core parameters are changing with this temperature. Now, number 43 material has a Curie temperature of 130 degrees C. I have no idea if the inside temperature of this core is above 130 degrees C or whether you see the effects of the Curie temperature long before you get to, to the actual number that's published. But 43 material is published as having a Curie temperature of greater than 130 degrees. And if we look at the plots here, so what I did is I took in order to generate the, a lot of power in the core very quickly, I put six turns along that on an FT240-43 core. It's again, 1.85 megahertz. And I only put 150 volts um, across the core. That made the core have 189 gauss in it, which was a little bit more than I had before, but I could do this with a lower power output. And the reason I had to do this is because I had to let each one of these stabilize long enough that I knew I was really at the temperature and then I could real quickly disconnect it and measure it in my network analyzer. And what I saw, let me take these and make them all smaller. What I saw was the red trace at the bottom was the expected power dissipation according to SimSmith 
before a core that was at the 17 degrees Celsius, which was the ambient temperature in my basement. By the time I got to 30 degrees Celsius, and again, the in, this was 30 degrees, but that's 30 degrees surface. The inside may be a little bit warmer. I saw the expected dissipation had gone up to 24, uh, from 22 watts to 24 watts. By the time I got to 50 degrees Celsius right here, the dissipation had gone up to 29.7 watts. By the time I got to 75 degrees Celsius, get right on there, 33.7 watts. By the time I got to 100 degrees Celsius, it was 45 watts. So the dissipation in the 43 material core doubled as the temperature rose, which means now that the core is, you know, is, is in deep trouble because the temperature rise was not slowing down with time. So that's something to consider if you're really going to run things at high temperature. But I thought this was interesting that I could, it was able to see the effects of uh, running into the Curie temperature. Now, this was not saturation in the core. This was the effects of the Curie temperature, I believe. After I'd made all the measurements for the video and had cleaned everything up, I was thinking about the topic of saturation and whether or not we might be able to measure whether a core was saturated or not without actually burning it up. The conventional wisdom is you have a heating problem long before you ever have saturation. And I was wondering if I could propose an experiment. I haven't done this experiment, but this is what I was thinking of. A generator, it doesn't matter the frequency particularly, and a load, and an SWR bridge, which reads SWR instantly. This SWR bridge will read SWR on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis of RF, so I don't need to have the RF present for very long. And if you were to get saturation, I would expect to see the inductance value drop. So what I've done here is I've taken a, a core. I haven't, again, I haven't done this, but I did some calculations. A T130-2 core with 10 turns on it. It's about one microhenry of inductance. And if I put it in a circuit where I have 270 volts across it, roughly, I have 450 gauss. That is four times the maximum recommended value. And this will cause heating extremely quickly and I wonder if or not whether this would cause saturation. So what we do is we take this core, we would resonate it with a capacitor, and the capacitor has to be stout enough that it doesn't cause any kind of issues with the circuit itself. So if we look at the SWR in this circuit, what we see is it resonates at about 1.85 megahertz. And if we look at the waveforms that come out of the SWR bridge, we have a forward voltage and a reverse voltage. The reverse voltage is not zero due to a couple things. Primarily the fact that the inductor does not have a real high Q and there's some small resistance here that when you resonate it, you don't come back down in the, the path here. doesn't come back down exactly where you started from uh, due to the loss in the inductor primarily. And what I'd propose to do would be to send a single dit of CW, which is quite a few RF cycles, but it's not enough to really heat this up very much, a single dit, and we'd look at what, would, what we'd see coming back. And if the inductance dropped as little as maybe 10%, look at the difference we'd see in the reflected voltage. This would be a proposed experiment, and perhaps I'll do it in the future, but I was just thinking about that. I don't think that we ever see saturation, long, I mean, we see heating long before that, but nevertheless, there's a lot of topics involved here that are, have been kind of fun. SimSmith helps us figure those out. And that's kind of about all I had for this video. If you like it, give me a thumbs up, please. If you comments, please make them. And again, there'll be more videos.